life is a gift because we don't mean to, but it's so easy to take it for granted. Welcome to At the Heart of It. Welcome to At the Heart of It. I'm Nancy Brown, CEO of the American Heart Association. When you're young, successful, and have what many would consider the dream job, it's easy to feel like you're on top of the world and unstoppable. My next guest was living her best life, reporting on the biggest NFL fields and NBA courts. Yet the game of life threw her a curveball that stopped her in her tracks. Get ready for a testimonial on how to recover from a life-interrupted experience and discover how to turn your challenges into purpose. Who said sports was a man's game? Introducing Jen Hale. Jen is a sports journalist, TV host, and founder of Sideline Pass, a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering and educating young women to become strong, confident, and successful future leaders. You can see Jen reporting on the sidelines at NFL games and on the court for the New Orleans Pelicans. Her talents have led her to win multiple awards, including Emmy and Associated Press Awards. Jen is also the first woman to receive the Bob Rosler Award. Listen to how Jen is breaking the glass ceiling for women and inspiring all of us to take better care of ourselves. Jen, it is so good to see you again. Thank you for being with me today. Hi, Nancy. Anytime, anything for you. You know that. Oh, and that feeling is very mutual. I have some fun questions to start us off. I call these my signature five. Tell me the last TV show you watched or streamed. Ooh, Outlander. Ah, love that. How about the last great meal you had? Ooh, my home-cooked gumbo. Oh, that sounds good. Next time, invite me. The last book you read? Last book I read was uh, The NFL Draft Guide. Oh, my goodness. Now, I won't add that to my reading list. Uh, what, what was your first job, Jen? Uh, professionally or ever? Ever. Babysitting. Ah, babysitting. There you go. And tell us, what is your superpower? My superpower is I bloom where I'm planted. My mother's always told me that. That's good. That's a good superpower to have. Well, Jen, so many people know you as a Fox Sports NFL sideline reporter, but not everyone knows about the time when you felt fatigued at work, ignoring the signs of your heart condition, and even denying what was going on with your body. Tell us about your journey. Uh, kind of crazy, Nancy. Uh, I look back and just I shake my head. It's kind of still surreal to me that that was my life. Um, I've always been very athletic. I was an athlete all through high school and college and kept that healthy, active lifestyle up as an adult, uh, which certainly helped with my schedule as a sports reporter because I was always on red eye flights, running on two or three hours of sleep for a couple of days until I could catch up, depending on the assignments. And uh, I always credited good nutrition, uh, exercise and good rest when I could squeeze it in as keys to keeping that lifestyle afloat. Well, um, six years ago now, actually, I was feeling extremely fatigued when the NBA season ended and I did my normal, okay, I'm going to catch up. I'm going to rest for a week, sleep 10 hours a night. And it just never stopped. 10 hours turned into 11 hours, turned into 12 hours. I started sleeping through alarms. And then when I was working out, all of a sudden I was huffing and puffing. It used to be nothing. It'd be energizing to run five miles or cycle 15. And all of a sudden I couldn't run a half mile without just pouring sweat, um, being so out of breath. I was very frustrated with myself and I thought, geez, what is going on? Perhaps, perhaps cause I'm approaching 40, this is the aging process, but surely it can't be this drastic. Uh, I went and saw a doctor. They drew blood. They did blood work. She said, oh, you're low in vitamin B and vitamin D. And yeah, as you approach your 40s, that's what happens. So she put me on some prescription level supplements and it did absolutely no good. Um, the fatigue 
worsened. As a matter of fact, I was throwing a baby shower for uh, a friend of mine, along with a group of my girlfriends, and the shower was supposed to start at noon and go till two. I didn't wake up that day until 4 p.m. I had slept through them calling. One of them had even come and knocked on my door and I never heard it. I started being very short of breath while I was sleeping and I would wake up trying to catch my breath as if I just run and I hadn't obviously I'd been asleep and I know people who are listening to this say oh my gosh those are classic heart failure symptoms but because of my healthy lifestyle because of my age I've never smoked a cigarette I've never tried a drug if I drink it's red wine I always thought heart problems were affiliated with folks who ate too much fried food smoked and led an unhealthy lifestyle it never crossed my mind that it could affect somebody like me at my stage in life i also thought oh you know maybe when i'm 80 that might be something i have to worry about but not now i ended up going to another doctor and he took x-rays of my chest my heart didn't show anything and i didn't end up finding out what was going on with me until probably I would say seven months after I started experiencing symptoms. And at this point, the symptoms were so bad. Uh, I was at NBA meetings in New York and I was feeling whole indigestion. I was exhausted. Um, so at our lunch break, instead of eating, I went up to my room to take a cat nap, try to, you know, recharge. And I ended up sleeping until housekeeping came the next morning. Wow. Yeah, I was on my way from those meetings to Charlotte to work an NFL game. And my broadcast partner at that time, Rondé Barber and I, we used to work out together. Uh, we're very close friends. And he kept saying, something is wrong with you. And I said, I'm just tired. I just need to suck it up and get in gear. Well, trying to roll my suitcase from the car just into the hotel, again, pouring sweat, huffing and puffing. And he looked at me and said, uh-uh, uh-uh, something is really wrong. That weekend, my ankles started swelling. The swelling uh, went so far up that I couldn't zip my skirt or my pants. The next day when I got back to New Orleans that I ended up in the emergency room and ultimately a week in the cardiac intensive care unit being diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy. Wow, what a story and what a journey. And it is unimaginable to think what must have been going through your mind at that point. And I know as a survivor and a thriver, you are really focused on helping to make sure that people pay attention to their body and understand the risk. Tell us a little bit more, because there's a little more to the story. There is your family history. Um, ultimately, the extraordinary medical care you received. Tell us about that. Absolutely. So. My grandfather, my father, and my uncle all died 50 or younger of what we classified as heart attacks. You know, obviously medical research has come very far since then. For my grandfather, we didn't know too much. He in fact died, my, my dad was a baby, so he doesn't—he didn't even have any memories of his father, only photographs. Um, I can remember my father the last few years of his life, and it turns out he knew he had a heart problem. He used to, he was a federal agent, so he traveled a great deal for work, and he never told us. When he would check into the hospital, he would just tell us he was going on road trips because he didn't want us to worry. He felt like, A, hopefully he could beat it. B, there would be time enough for us to worry and be sad if indeed he lost the fight with heart disease. So to him, he was protecting us. Uh, he died a few days after I graduated high school. I was the oldest. Uh, my brother was eight and my sister was 12. My brother still to this day, he remembers him, but eh, you know, eight's, eight's pretty young. Yeah. So anyway, I always thought a heart attack. My dad had a stressful job. He smoked, he drank a lot of beer. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's always what I, I chalked it up to. Um, after my diagnosis, which by the way, um, because I'd been to two doctors before I was diagnosed, I really felt like it was in my head. And Nancy, if I could go back, if there's anything I would really encourage folks is to trust yourself, trust your gut. Um, I knew something was wrong. Of course, you don't want something to be wrong, but you know something's wrong. And because I'd had those two doctors say, no, nope, you're fine. I wanted to let it go and just tell myself it was in my head. And that was absolutely the wrong decision because the earlier you catch this, the more proactive you are, the better your chances are. When I got back from that football game in Charlotte, my stomach was just burning. And so I made an appointment with a gastroenterologist. He ran some tests. 
he scheduled me for more tests and a scope and sent me on my way. I'm at my car, ready to go home, getting in my car. And he calls me on my cell phone and says, I just don't feel right about this. You have the classic signs and symptoms of heart failure. I really want you to go to the ER. I thought he was being extremely dramatic. I yeah. didn't need to go to the ER. I was walking, talking, breathing. Something was off, but not emergency room off. Well, how little did I know how wrong I was uh, in the ER? They, that's where they, they wouldn't let me go home that night. That's when they told me, in fact, you have cardiomyopathy. We're going to have to wait till tomorrow until we can run more tests. And, you know, I'm Googling on my phone all the different causes, all the different types. Never crossed my mind that my uncle and my father and my grandfather's heart problems could have been cardiomyopathy. After I was actually diagnosed and my heart was all the way down to a 16% pumping function. So dilated cardiomyopathy, I mentioned there are several types. Dilated means your heart has stretched out. The left side of my heart had stretched. And my cardiologist explained it to me that if you think of the heart like a rubber band, uh, the rubber band works best when it can bounce back and forth, right? So the left side of my heart was big and floppy and stretched out. It didn't have any more elasticity. So it wasn't pumping the blood into my body. That's why I was so short of breath. That's why I couldn't exercise. Uh, that's why my ankles and waists had ended up swelling. My first initial diagnosis, the initial round of cardiologists told me, look, there are two outcomes. You're either going to need a heart transplant or you have a five-year life expectancy. That's when you were down to 16% function in your heart with cardiomyopathy, that's the reality. They they sent in a chaplain. They sent in a psychologist because they told me I wasn't accepting the diagnosis. And I wasn't. I was ready to fight. Yep. And thankfully, um, I was referred to the head of the transplant unit for the state of Louisiana, who was absolutely wonderful, Dr. Clem Eisworth. And he said, you know, those are possible scenarios and you need to prepare yourself for that. He said, but there is another possible scenario. There's this new medication that can shrink your heart. They call it heart remodeling. No guarantees. It works for about a third of the people. He said, what you have going in your favor is you've lived a healthy lifestyle and you're in shape and you're young. What is working against you is you let your heart get all the way down to 16%. So to come that far back, that's going to be tough. Right. So I ended up wearing a, a life vest, a defibrillator vest to shock my heart back into function uh, for over six months and waited to see if this medication would work. And after, I believe it was seven months, I was able to stop wearing the vest. And finally, after two and a half years, I was able to come off the heart transplant list because the medication worked for me. Yeah. And it is such a blessing from God. And I feel like I was left here on this earth for a purpose. And it's to tell my story and help encourage other people to catch this thing early. Don't ignore it. Now I take a handful of pills at night, a handful of pills in the morning, and I lead a relatively normal life. Uh, my life was very altered for five years, but now it's fairly normal. Where you look back at my dad and my uncle just 20 years ago, and this was a death sentence for them. Right. So it is amazing to me how far research and technology has brought us. It literally gave me my life back. I'm not supposed to be here. I wouldn't be here if this were 20 years ago. So that's why I'm such a huge proponent of the American Heart Association and any efforts to research and fight and make advancements in the treatment of heart disease. And we are so lucky to have you as an advocate. It's such an incredible story, Jen. And, you know, I think of how brave you are to have gone through all of that and now to share your story with other people. How has this life experience changed who you are? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm probably still finding that out, Nancy. So I feel like um, I have a whole new appreciation for life and feel it is most definitely a gift. It is not promised. So use every moment to its fullest. Live every moment to its fullest. I no longer worry about a lot of the little things. I know this is going to sound very strange to people, but those two and a half years when I didn't know what my future held, there was a 33% chance die, a 33% chance I would need a transplant, and a 33% chance the medication would work. Yes, it was very hard. But on the other hand, it is some of the most joyful years I ever remember because I let all the little stuff go. And I just savored every second that I could be up and out in the world and living life because I was very cognizant of the possibility that I wouldn't have that chance 
in a yeah. year or so. I might be bedridden. I might not be here. So going to work, seeing my coworkers, oh my gosh, it, I was so grateful for that. Somebody cut me off in the grocery store parking lot. Trust me, that's not a problem. You probably said thank you to them, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, exactly. I know what problems are, and that's not one of them. Yeah. So um, I would say that's that's how it's changed me the most. And my resolution to myself now, besides spreading the word, um, is to not lose that gratefulness, to not lose that perspective of life is a gift, because we don't mean to, but it's so easy to take it for granted. So true. And you know, as I see you on television, you know, on the sideline of the NBA and at the NFL games. I'm so proud of you as a woman leader and knowing everything you have been through. I consider you a role model for managing work without compromising well-being. Do you have any other tips beyond gratitude, um, which I know is at the top of your list, that you would give our listeners today? Yeah, you know, I would say um, you brought up being a female, certainly, and you know all about this, Nancy, being a woman in a man's world. Um, I, I hid my diagnosis for a couple of reasons. One, I couldn't take everybody asking me how I was feeling all the time. Right. And I know they would be doing it out of a place of love. But to get through that two and a half years, I had to try to put it out of my mind as much as possible. But secondly, I was also very concerned that uh, employers, future employers, potential employers would look at me as damaged goods. You know, oh, well, what if something happens while she's at work? You know what? We just better stay away from this. I, I think it's it's very hard for women to show weakness, right? Um, I, I very much felt like I have to be better than the boys. I have to be impenetrable. I have to be on my A game at all times. And I'm still glad I handled it the way I handled it. But I can say it was very refreshing, all the support I got afterwards. Um, right. And I think that that stigma, that persona is changing. But I also think it's still a real dynamic that women wrestle with. And so I would encourage anyone who finds themselves in that situation, find, find some good support, find some good friends, folks to talk to, to figure out what works best for you. Because you, you can't do it alone. You are going to need somebody somewhere to put their arms around you and love you, even if you want to keep that circle very small. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I think for all of us in our everyday life, sisterhood, friendship, all of those things matter. And, you know, Jen, you mentioned working in a male-dominated business. And I know that you have learned a lot about negotiating for yourself in a male-dominated world. Any tips for us? Absolutely. Take the emotion out of it. Um, go in with facts. It's not about how you feel. It's about black and white facts. Um, also, be overprepared. That, that, that's something I have lived by since I started in this business. Um, I am always going to try to play chess. I don't know who's playing checkers and who's playing chess, but I'm going to walk in ready to play chess. Love that. That that the strategy is so important, and I think taking emotion out of many situations in our life is great advice. So you work in such a fast-paced heavy travel industry. Last time I saw you, you were going like three places in the next four days. You, you made me feel like I was a slacker, you know? And, and of course, sports reporting itself can be so stressful because it's real time happening. You can't really prepare for what's going to happen because you don't know how the game is going to unfold. How do you manage your stress and how do you practice self-care? Um, exercise. I always feel better after, after I get some good endorphins going. Even when I'm exhausted and I really just want to go to bed, I make myself go hop on the bike, hop on the treadmill, do something for 30 minutes. And then making time for friends, making time for that inner circle. Maybe it's family and friends. Maybe it's mainly family. Maybe it's mainly friends. Um, that's my reset. And I'm, I'm so grateful for those in my life that, that are that inner circle and that give me that joy and that stability. And obviously who helped you through such a tough time in your life. You know, you mentioned once that you thought admitting how sick you were was admitting weakness. Now you're on the other side of this. What do you believe and how would you help others who might be in a similar situation think about their situation? I still absolutely understand why I felt that way. And I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a mistake, unfortunately. I think in some situations, it's a reality. 
I wish and hope that stories like this can get the message out that just because someone's battling something like this doesn't mean they're damaged goods, doesn't mean they can't do their job to their best ability. Um, in fact, I think I was even better at my job because, again, as I mentioned, I was relishing every moment of life. And if I never got to cover another game, this was going to be the best darn game I ever covered type of a thing. Um, but but I do think there's that stigma and that concern out there. I think that's something we have to talk about and examine and as a society, you know, not just as individuals. I respect whatever anybody would feel in their individual situation. I don't know, obviously, what folks' individual situations would be. But I hope through discussions like this, we can help educate folks about all the things you can do while you're recovering from heart disease and that it isn't necessarily a death sentence. It doesn't mean that you can't function normally, quite the contrary. And education about that is so critical. Yeah, very well said. Okay, tell me what you do for fun. You are so busy. I know you find time for fun. What do you do when you want to have fun? I'm from New Orleans. We <laughs> the word fun. All you can say is I'm from New Orleans, period. That that says it all. Yeah. Mic drop. I take for granted and I constantly try to remind myself how lucky I am that we can just pop down the street on a Friday night and take in this world class performance that other folks would have to travel for and get a hotel for. Um, also being active, you know, uh, water skiing, when it allows, snow skiing. I love to surf only happens once or twice a year, but wow. yeah, I love it when I can. I'm happy to know that about you. I will stand on the side of an ocean and cheer you on someday. I don't think I would find myself on a surfboard. Jen, what's the best advice you have been given personally or professionally? And then the opposite of that, what is the best advice or words of wisdom you would give our listeners? I think the best advice I've been, I've been given personally um, is probably by my mom. And she told me, you know, it's all about balance. There are a few things in this world that are all bad or all good, but for the most part, most things, it's all about that balance, right? It can be really good until you go over here and now it's bad, or it can be really bad until you go over here and it's good. So you've got to think critically and find that balance in your life with everything. Working too much can be bad. Working too little can be bad as well. Um, same with friends, social life, um, activities. So balance is something that's really important to me and something I try to be cognizant of quite a bit. Um, and then you said the best advice I've ever given. Yes, or words of wisdom or a favorite quote, any of those that you might like to share. I guess I would say uh, to aspiring female journalists, I still think I have been well served by uh, shooting to be better than the boys being overprepared. And that's no knock on males at all. Just as a female in the sports world, it's the reality. Once again, I'm not saying it's right. It's something I hope goes away. But the reality is when a female walks into a sports setting, and there's probably lots of other settings this applies to as well, lawyers, political coverage, whatnot. Um, people want to know how you got there. Did you get here because you're good? Or did you get here because you use some sort of nefarious means? And it's terrible that that's the test you walk into right away. But again, I'm just telling you that's the reality. So you have to come in ready to prove your worth and while you're there and then be true to yourself. You know, this is a crazy world, especially with social media. Um, there's so many different stigmas and ideas of what we're supposed to be. I guess if there's one thing I could say that served me the best and that I get more and more comfortable with as I get older and get further along in this business, I am who I am. I'm darn proud of it and I'm not changing for anybody. I'm happy to have an inner circle who gives me constructive criticism, but I'm not going to make drastic changes to be somebody else because uh, who I am is good enough. I love that. Jen Hale, thank you for many things. First of all, thank you for telling your story. Thank you for being an inspiration for women, young and old, to go after their dreams. Thank you for the great advice. And thank you for being such a good friend. It is so good to have you today. I am really grateful to you. And I know we will see each other soon. Absolutely, Nancy. Thank you for all you do for everyone who suffers from heart disease or who may in the future. I know you've dedicated your life to figuring this disease out. And we all thank you so much. Thank you, Jen Hale. We'll see you soon. Bye, Nancy. Bye-bye. 
Jen Hale is an amazing woman for so many reasons. First of all, we're so thankful that she made it through her very serious cardiovascular diagnosis with such great outcomes. And that really does show the power, as she said, of science and medical research. She bravely tells her story because she is committed to helping everyone everywhere know to listen to your body and to make sure that you do everything you can every day to protect your health and well-being. Maybe the most important thing I heard from Jen today was her focus on what it takes to be successful in life, being overprepared, knowing and understanding your audience, making sure you bring your best self to work every day. And she did that during her illness, and she certainly does it now. I would love to know what you took away from our conversation today. Please subscribe, comment, and share. I'm Nancy Brown. Thank you for being with us today. On the next At the Heart of It, earning a second lease at life. One of the things that I realized that I needed to do more was to ask for help, to say maybe I'm not okay. Discover how actor Jason Gray Stanford is finding new purpose after a life-altering diagnosis. Next, At the Heart of It.